Um, now, before uh, I left, um, I told you folks that we're, we're doing a series in the book of John. We're going to work through the entire book of John over the coming days, and um, we kind of, we skipped because um, there's just a reason for it. I wanted John, Pastor Jonathan to be able to preach on the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, and thank you, Jonathan, for filling in for me. I'm, I'm just grateful for you. Our young youth pastor here is, uh, is growing in the Lord, and I, I would encourage you to encourage him and pray for him. Um, he's got a very important job to, to do with our, our young people, and uh, we just, we just want to encourage him. So if you haven't already, make yourself known to him and, uh, and maybe uh, try and encourage him some way. Um, we just love you, Jonathan. I'm so glad. This, it's been almost a year that Jonathan's been with us, and um, we're just thankful. Doing a great job with our, our youth program, and we're just looking forward to what God's going to continue to do in and through your ministry, Jonathan. But anyways, on, on that point, you know, Jonathan started off uh, chapter 6, so we had skipped forward, and now we're back to chapter 6 um, in, in my absence. And, and as you recall, uh, the miracle that Jesus performed, uh, he ended up feeding 5,000 men, and that's not including the women and children. So we're looking at a group of maybe, you know, I, if, assuming that there's twice as many people as the men there, probably about 10,000 people. Um, Jesus performed this great miracle, and, and um, you know, after this miracle was done, after Jesus performed this miracle, um, he wanted to spend some time alone in prayer. And uh, I'm sure there's reasons. It doesn't exactly explain to us in the scriptures why he wanted to do this, but he did. And we see that he sent his disciples on ahead of him to travel by boat to Capernaum, knowing full well what he was planning to do next. There's nothing that takes God by surprise. There's no chances. Everything has a strategic plan. Did you know that? There's nothing that happens in our lives or in the history of this world, that's out of the scope of God's control. God understands what is happening right now in your life. He understands what's happening in my life, in the life of our assembly. Um, that's comforting. But comforting when we're on cloud nine, right? Can you imagine? Okay, well, here we are. Here, Jesus dismissed this great crowd of Five to 10,000 people, something like that. He dismissed them. And uh, he told his disciples, I want you to get into a boat and cross over the lake to Capernaum. John 6, our text this morning is John 6, chapter 16 to 21. So in the first two verses of our text, we read, When evening came, his disciples went out to, down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. Now, by now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. So in this particular setting, the disciples had just witnessed one of the most spectacular miracles of Jesus' earthly ministry. And, and, and if, you, if you could be transported back in time to be part of what took place there, and you saw what happened with the five barley loaves and two fish and how after Christ blessed it, the, the, the bread and the fish were broken and it fed the entire crowd and not just that, but there were basketfuls, 12 basketfuls in fact, of food left over, you would probably be on cloud nine, particularly if you were one of the 12 disciples. Can you imagine? You are serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and bread is appearing before your eyes as a miracle to feed hungry people all around you, including yourselves. What happened with the 12 basketfuls left over? I don't know. Maybe you distribu they distribute it to the poor people. Maybe they kept some of it for themselves to supply the need for the, the mission they were on. It doesn't really say, but you would be on cloud nine 
Like, I'd be like, wow, praise the Lord. I got to participate in this giant miracle that God performed. I actually got to pass the bread that multiplied. Wow, isn't that cool? Very mountaintop kind of experience here, I think. Now, maybe you, in your life, let's bring it down to today in our context. Maybe you've had a marvelous encounter with Jesus. Maybe you have tasted your fill of miraculous spiritual bread that's come into you and has filled you to overflowing. And you recognize that this is not of myself. This is a gift of God. And, 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 you, and, you, and you feel elated, and, and you're on cloud nine. Most people who come to salvation experience how it feels to have their spiritual hunger immediately satiated when we taste of the glory of God. It's a good thing. It's a tremendous taste. It's a taste of heaven. In the place of spiritual abundance... The grass appears to be greener. I've talked to people that got saved and they're like, man, the grass is so green. The colors are so vibrant. Everything seems more alive. It's because the Holy Spirit has brought spiritual life into us and we get the connection now between the Creator and the creation and we're so thankful that we've been saved. Maybe we've had an extra special touch from God. We've been in a dry place and God's put his hand on us and we've had this extra special touch from God and we feel like could it be any better maybe we should build a settlement here you think that's what the disciples were uh, thinking when Jesus did all the loaves and fishes miracles hey what a perfect place as an amphitheater to 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 preach the gospel to all these people who are going to come from everywhere let's make let's make a, a camp here and and every day God Jesus, you can make new bread every day and satiate the hunger of these people day in and day out while you teach them spiritual truths. You can meet all their physical needs too. Oh, how good is that? Think about it. They could stay on the mountainside miraculously seeing the bread baskets filled and their stomachs filled and them satisfied and hearing the voice of the almighty God speaking through Jesus. Wow, what a place to be. See, is it God's will for us to live in perpetual physical blessings and abundance in tandem with the spiritual blessings we receive? That's a question this morning. This is where some people get the story of Jesus' miraculous feeding of the people wrong. Some people have heard, and it's taught out there, that because Jesus satisfies the deepest spiritual hunger inside of us, and it's a never-ending supply, it is also God's will that in our lives as disciples of Jesus, we will continue day in and day out to be on a mountaintop of the blessing of God's physical provisions as well. If only we have enough faith. This... Turn on your internet and listen to some preachers out there on your TV. It's popular teaching. Concerning spiritual abundance and blessings, the question is not if it is God's will for us or not to live in the realm of consistent spiritual blessing. It is. God wants you to be filled with the Spirit and to live in the Spirit. It's clearly His desire. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, it is written, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You hear how full that is? You hear every spiritual blessing out of the heavenly realms in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made us known. He made known to us, rather, the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Amen. What a powerful, powerful truth-packed Scripture. So having read that, you see that it is God's will that we live in spiritual abundance, that we're filled with the Spirit daily. So how does this translate for us in the physical fallen world that we find ourselves living in. We see in the above passage that Jesus has given us every spiritual blessing under heaven. We have received the water of life that will quench our thirst so that we will not thirst again. And the bread of heaven from God supernaturally in the Spirit, but as a result of the blessings of the spiritual freedom we've received in Christ, the question remains, if the spiritual blessing will translate over into the physical realm that we presently live in. Now, since it's God's will that we live in the abundance of his spiritual blessings and wholeness, would it not also be the will of God for us to live continually in a state of physical blessing and wholeness? That's the reasoning that some people have. Some would say yes, But is that what the Bible teaches? Now it's certainly clear that there are times when God blesses his children physically. I have three things that God did on our trip out to Manitoba to pick up our parents that are miracles that I could share with you. It's certainly clear that God chooses to bless us physically sometimes. He provides for us when we have needs. And sometimes God goes over the top beyond what we need and just gives us abundance abnormally. But is this every day something we can expect every day? You know, it's also true that there are times when God supernaturally protects us from calamity. And sometimes God supernaturally heals us of our various physical ailments. Our God saves, delivers, and heals. He's capable of doing all of these things. He's the creator after all. All he needs to do is say the word. But is spirit experiencing physical abundance solely based upon the state of our faith? Well, I would argue, yes, sometimes... We have not because we ask not. So there is a connection. But what about those times where God says no? My friends, what I'm trying to say is that the difficulty or ease of our present path in the physical state is not determined by us. It is sovereignly determined by God. In other words, there's times when God sovereignly determines that it's best for us to experience physical abundance and sometimes it is God's will for us that we endure physical suffering. This is the Bible's teaching. If you've heard otherwise, I would encourage you to search diligently the Word of God from beginning to end and search the Scriptures and you will see that that is not the case. 
Paul speaks about the fact that all of us as servants of God will have to physically suffer. In Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 21, Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that creation, the creation itself, will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. There is a day coming where all suffering shall cease, but that day is not today. There is a promise in the word of God of a heavenly dwelling where there will be no more pain or suffering. There will be no more evil, but that day is not today. Paul continues to suggest to us as God's children in Romans 8.28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Can God? Can God work something good through our suffering? Yes, he can. You see, naming and claiming physical health and prosperity is not ours to claim. It is a sovereign decision of God as to what he distributes, when he distributes, and how he distributes these things. And it is all in accordance with God's sovereign plan that is eternal, not temporal. We don't always see things the way God sees things. Sometimes you just have to go, you know what, Lord? I don't understand this, but yet will I trust you. God does not give us financial stability and physical health so that our lives are more pleasurable or so that things will be easier sailing for us along the way. No. When God gives his children physical health and prosperity, it is so that we can use these gifts to accomplish his kingdom purposes. I am not my own. I was purchased with a price. When I become a believer in Jesus Christ, everything I am and everything that I have belongs to the King of Kings. It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. God has purposed to work in and through his people, not because he has to, but because he delights in having sons and daughters follow him and be able to participate with him in his good work. It is not my work, it is his. My life is not my own. Jesus did not multiply the bread and the fish to feed the thousands because it was a repeating trend that he wanted to start. No, this miracle was specifically done to point people to the fact that they could put their trust in him and he would meet all of their needs. There were spiritual lessons to be learned about the sovereign goodness of God by providing a miracle of provision in the physical realm, the physical miracle of was done to amplify a spiritual truth. Money and good times when everything is going so sweet and well all the time. I don't know about you, but my heart tends to wander Maybe you're like me. I think this is part of the human nature. And God understands that. There's going to be times when God multiplies the bread on the water or or on the hillside and fills you to the very brim and, and you can distribute it to others and that's blessing and that's great and that's God's purpose and that's God's plan and so should it be. But then there are times when God calls you to cast offshore into deep, stormy waters. It's not by chance. It's not because of a lack of faith that you're cast into deep and stormy waters. It's because it is the command of the Lord that you go out there. Scripturally speaking, 
The human heart, without the grace of God and the, and, and, and the tempering of God, it wanders, right? That's why there's so much fighting and stuff that goes on in churches. Consider what James says, the Apostle James says in James 4, 1-3. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill, you covet. But you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. See, the physical realm in our broken and fallen world of sin is different than what takes place in the, in the spiritual realm. Is the spiritual or is the physical realm affected by the spiritual realm? Absolutely. Miraculously. But I believe that we lead people in the wrong conclusion when we teach in tandem with the abundance of spiritual blessings that are ours every day. It is God's will that we should always experience health, wealth, and prosperity in the physical because it is clearly stated in the Scripture that it is not in tandem with the spiritual blessings. There are storms on the horizon of my life and of your lives. There are storms on the horizon. And it's good for us to understand that the Lord of heaven sends us into those storms to accomplish His sovereign purposes through those storms. You see, after Jesus had physically filled these baskets in the stomachs of the people with the bread and the fish, the disciples might have been wondering if there was ever a time when God wouldn't transform the landscape of their physical destiny in the future here. So they would no longer need to work for their bread. Wouldn't that be great? Every morning there's a new basket of food, kind of like manna from heaven. See, God does manna, but also God calls us to go to work. You know? So, so after, after seeing this great miracle, these disciples, they, they're told by the Lord to get into the boat and go out into the sea and to go ahead of him into Capernaum. And he knew exactly what he was doing. In our text in the book of John, we're told they got into the boat and they set sail. In Matthew's gospel, it goes into greater detail in the context of the voyage. In Matthew 14, 20 to 22, we read, they all ate and were satisfied, referring to the miracle. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get... Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. This was not their idea. Going on to the lake at night was God's idea. We can confidently say that Jesus sent his disciples into the lake. He made them leave the scene of miraculous physical security and provision and victory, knowing full well what would happen next. John 6, 18, we read, A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. My friend, it was Jesus who sent those disciples into the storm of physical calamity. Just in case you misunderstand the way God works because of some of these popular teachings that are out there, the Lord does not always send us into times of physical health, wealth, and prosperity. It's not a matter of faith in many cases as to whether you enter a deep and stormy sea in life. There are times, my friend, when God's sovereign will commands you to leave the safety of the shore and enter deep and stormy waters. John 6, 19, 21 continues. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. And then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Wow, another miracle. There's other perspectives on this. Consider Mark's gospel. Mark says this in Mark 6, 47 to 50. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. 
he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass them, but then they saw him walking on the lake. They thought he was a ghost, and they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. You see the amplification of what's happening here? This is no simple storm here. These are experienced Galilean fishermen. They know full well the power of the waters on the Sea of Galilee. For you, if, those of you who don't know, violent storms can break out on the Sea of Galilee and swamp small boats. I think uh, Pastor Rick at CCLF had a crew, crew of people over and they went out on a little cruise to have a worship service out on the Sea of Galilee. And while they were out there, a sudden squall came upon them where it was downright scary. This is no ordinary storm here. This is like calamitous storm. These fishermen were struggling to stay, everything they had to stay afloat. What a picture, eh? And from Matthew's perspective, in Matthew's gospel, I, I want to give you the three, the three gospel perspectives here. Shortly before dawn, in Matthew 14, 25 to 33, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come out on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he says, why did you doubt? And when they had climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So you see this collage of perspectives make up this very picturistic thing that God did. What a picture. What a picture of how things actually go sometimes in everybody's life, right? Right after seeing great spiritual victories coupled with the abundance of supernatural blessings in the physical realm, God in His wisdom often sends us from a place of security and comfort into deep, turbulent waters. Jesus knew the Sea of Galilee. He knew what was about to take place, and He sent them out. Why did Jesus send them out alone? Why, after such great victory with the multiplication miracle the Lord performed, did He send them into a catastrophic storm? Well, I'd like to ask you this question. What about you? No sooner do we experience a major high point in our spiritual life with God, where God miraculously supplies our needs, then we're all of a sudden asked by God to step into a boat and to sail into a dangerous territory. And not only do we get asked to step into dangerous territory, in fact, we're lashed by the wind and the waves of calamity. Maybe this is where you are today. Sometimes the things we face in life are dark, windy, wavy, and scary. From our perspective, the Lord appears to be absent. Has He abandoned us? Does it feel like the Lord has left you alone to battle through the storm that you're facing in your life? Maybe you're ill or your loved one is ill or maybe you've been betrayed in a relationship. Maybe your finances are in disorder and it's like there's a drain hole in the bottom and you don't know what to do. Maybe you're maligned. You're persecuted. Your character has been butchered. Maybe you have forgotten. Does Jesus even care about you? Or the people that are in your boat traveling the stormy waters with you? See, from a human standpoint, 
my friends, the disciples were in grave danger of sinking. But from God's perspective, the trial that they endured was a necessary part of helping them learn to trust Him even when circumstances were not favorable in the physical. At just the right time, Jesus went out to his disciples and met them in the middle of the storm. <laughs> they were so overwhelmed by the severity of this storm, they almost couldn't believe it was him. They were, they were so focused on keeping themselves afloat and not sinking that they thought he was even a ghost. We're talking disciples that hours before had witnessed Jesus multiply and bread and fish and feed thousands of people. He just preached this marvelous sermon and the power of what they experienced was fresh. But the storm overtook them and they soon lost focus. The same disciples who saw Jesus miraculously feed the people lost hope in the midst of the storm. You see... Humans, we're so shifty. One moment we can be here and the next moment down here. All of us are like this, if we're honest. When things start to happen that are bad, we start to question. But you see, Jesus understood where they were at and he wanted to teach them something. And just at the right time, he came to them walking over top of the storm on top of the waters, speaking that he has mastery over it. That's what he's saying by doing this. And he says, do not be afraid. It is I. It is I. Do not be afraid. You know, the, what Jesus is saying is, I am. That's what he's saying here. Do not be afraid because I am. He was the mighty creator and sustainer of the universe. If he was merely a man, they might be afraid. But the one who made the Sea of Galilee in the first place caused the waters in the Sea of Galilee to be calm at a word. See, not only did the twelve witness the supernatural power of Jesus as he walked over the water to meet them, but on that night... One of their own stepped out of the boat to walk to Jesus on the waves. What does this mean for us? Well, you know, Peter did step out. That's good. He stepped out. But that was shown to show us that even when we step out, we still can falter. Because Peter stepped out and then all of a sudden he's like, this is nuts, man. What am I doing standing on the water? This is like crazy. Look at this. Waves. Look. Oh, we're in the middle of the sea. And then as soon as he started doing that, he started to sink. The Lord didn't abandon him. He reached down into the waters and grabbed him and pulled him up. It is I. Don't you understand, Peter? Despite the disciples' general feelings of abandonment and, and, and despair, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus planned on this. He made his disciples get into the boat. In Matthew's Gospel, it says it. And go to Capernaum without him. You know, there's another miracle that's very similar to this one. An incident that took place as well on the Sea of Galilee involving a boat and a storm. Mark's Gospel talks about it. In Mark 4, similar to what we see here, Jesus was teaching on one side of the lake and after the teaching was finished, he wanted to go to the other side of the lake so they set sail. And on this occasion, in Mark 4, 35, it says, that day when the evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat this time. There was also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? 
he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Be quiet, be still. And the waves died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. As calloused as the human heart is, sometimes God needs to hit us between the eyes with truth to show us something. Why did God do this kind of miracle twice? Twice he fed thousands of people. He did this to emphasize something. That in the first miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, there are 12 basketfuls left over, meaning there is more than enough spiritual food for all of Israel and more than enough to satisfy all 12 tribes. And then the second miracle was 4,000 and there were seven basketfuls left over. Why were there seven? Because seven is completion. There's more than enough food to supply the needs of every single person that places their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jews and Gentiles alike. He did it to emphasize the fact that He meets our needs according to His riches and glory. And we need not be afraid. We need not worry. He is with us if we place our trust in Him. And the miracles on the lake are to say that even when you walk through dark waters, when the storms come and blow against the boat that you're in and you're about to sink, you need not be afraid because the Lord your God is with you. He has not abandoned you. Jesus says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I will be with you to the very end of the age. And this is a promise you can take home with you. If you're in the middle of the calamity and you don't, can't see the light of day, you might think that Jesus does not notice where you're at. But He sees you where you are. He sees you in your circumstances. And He loves you and He cares about you. And He will come to you. Cast all of your anxieties upon him, for he cares for you. This was such an important lesson that it was repeated twice. Jesus was even in the boat with the disciples on the one occasion, sleeping. Why was he sleeping? Don't you care if we're going to drown? Why are you sleeping? Why are you not doing something about this, Jesus? What they're saying. How many times in our lives are we facing a storm and we're in a boat that's sinking? And we're like, God, where are you? Are, are you hard of hearing me and my cry for help? And Jesus is just like, you know what? I want you to put your trust in me. Put your trust in me, my son, my daughter. I have not abandoned you. I am right beside you. I'm as close as the mention of my name. I hear you. I see you. Yes, I have purposed you to go through this calamitous circumstance to teach you reliance upon me. That you are not God of your own destiny. You don't control the way things work out. I am. And I have purposed in you to do what according to my will is to be done. You are a child of God, my friend. And you are not your own. The Lord commands your vessel and He is with you. Whether it's in abundance, like the feeding, or if it's in the calamity of a great terrible storm in a dark ocean of circumstance. God has not forgotten you. See, Peter stepped out to meet Jesus, but then second-guessed himself and he began to sink. Sometimes that's us. Peter had to learn something important. Jesus wasn't just some ordinary guy. Yes, Jesus is the Son of Man, but Jesus is also the Son of God. He's a man in that he identifies with us and he's with us, but he is God in that he is sovereign over all. We didn't plan on encountering a storm in the sea of our lives but like Peter and the 11 disciples, he will take us through. He's watching over us. See, Peter had to learn this lesson repeatedly. And so do you. And so do I. 
We're so easily rattled by storms, aren't we? We're so easily, our focus is taken off of, 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 of the sovereign power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, onto the circumstances, and we're so easily worried and anxious and, and, and worked up about things that we can't control. No, you can't control it, but there's a God in heaven who can, who takes care of us in the middle of it all, and he wants us to come to that place of full reliance on him. Peter learned this lesson. <laughs> See, in his letter, and we're going to close with this, in 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 to 7, this is Peter's letter to the church. I would like to encourage you in closing to listen to Peter's words and take them to heart. This is the man who sunk when he stepped out of the boat, right? And this is what he wrote later to the church. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Did you hear that? This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this you greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little while, you may have to suffer grief of all kinds in all kinds of trials. These have come, pay attention to this, referring to the trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Did you hear that, folks? The things that you're facing will turn out into something that is good in the end. God has a plan. In our finiteness, we don't see past the end of our nose. But God sees into eternity and knows exactly what it is that we need and exactly how to go about forming what he desires to form in and through us as his people. He's sovereign and he is good. When you're in the storm, sometimes you think, Jesus, are you good? Are you really good? Are you re That's human. Let's be honest. When we're getting hit, Jesus, are you really that good? And Jesus says, fear not. I am. I am. I am with you. I'll not leave you. I'll not forsake you. And this is why Paul says that he learned contentment in every circumstance in which he was placed, whether in plenty or in want. He learned the secret to contentment. That is, that this life is not all about this life. This life is a race that we run, and the finish line is drawing really close. Run in such a way as to win the prize, people. When you get close to the finish line, it hurts worse. If you are ever did in athletics and you pushed yourself to win the prize, you understand that everything you've got is put into the race, and near the end, you feel like it's going to come apart at the seams. You're giving it everything you can, and it hurts. But the prize awaits, and the finish line is coming. Keep your eyes on the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for your comfort to be upon those who are in the midst of a storm. God, you said that you'll not, never give us more than we can bear. And there's some here that feel like that they're actually on the edge of that. But God, I, God, I pray that you would help them to see the fact that you love them. That you have seen this circumstance for what it is. And you have a divine purpose to accomplish in and through it. 
God, help us all to put our trust in you, the great I am who is above the waves and the water, who is the commander of heaven's armies. Help us to put our trust in you because you are trustworthy, Lord Jesus. As we go our separate ways, God, may you minister to the hearts the balm of healing, the balm of comfort. God, would we be encouraged today to know that you're with us in good and bad times. In Jesus' name, amen.